John chapter 1, and we're going to go to 1 John real quick. Watch verse 14. John 1, 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of Him and cried out, said, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. Watch this. Never forget this verse. Of His fullness we have all received, grace for grace. Every moment you face chaos, you've already received from Jesus everything you need for the chaos. You are not hungry, starving, begging God for more. You have received of His fullness, grace for grace. This is why if you are feasting on the message that you need to do to get, then you've missed this verse. Of His fullness you have received, grace for grace. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Let me... Take a split second here and, and, and handle this. This is so weird to me. I, I read this, and I was reading this recently through this chapter, and you get to this bizarre moment where John goes, no one's seen God at any time. It's almost like a throw-in. I mean, he's in the middle of telling you the Word became flesh. Jesus is grace and truth. Of His fullness we've received grace for grace. And the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. No man's ever seen God. And you go, what? Why did you drop that in? No man's ever seen God. What? And then he says, but Jesus has manifested him. Look at the word exactly. Verse 18, the last part of the verse. The only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Greek word exegeomai, which really exegeomai is where we get the English word exegesis. And exegesis is not ex-Jesus. I used to think that when I'd hear guys go, well, we're going to exegete the word. And I'd think, well, that doesn't sound very clean. And... <laughs> Exegesis to me was the exegesis. Exegesis is a Greek word that to means to fully explain. So if you do exegesis of a scripture, then you fully explain its application. All right? Hermeneutics is where it fits in the passage. Exegesis is where it fits in you. That's a real elementary definition of exegesis, but you get the point. Why am I bringing that up? Well, because the Bible says that that's what Jesus did of the Father. He exegeted the Father. The same way a pastor exegetes scripture literally takes scripture fully explains it so why does john throw in no one's ever seen god just out of the blue no one's ever seen god because he wants to remind you god's invisible he doesn't have this body sitting on in this cosmic place until jesus he was he could have been considered little more than abstract and for me that's why the old testament time to time seems to be confused about god and then came Jesus. And John said, we never knew what God looked like because you know, God doesn't look like anything. And nobody's ever seen him. And then Jesus. And Jesus exegetes the Father. Jesus fully explains God. Jesus tells you what he looks like. Tells you what he sounds like. Tells you what he responds like. Well, what did Jesus say? Same guy. This is John. Go to 1 John chapter 4. I I'm, I'm trying to close. I don't have to. Well, I do eventually, but... I don't know. I am not getting the impression from people that they are wanting me to quit, but I, I just am trying to honor everyone's time. First John chapter four, verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is what? For this, the love of God was manifested toward us, made clear, displayed. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might, what? Live through Him. In the beginning was the Word. Remember? What was the Word? The Word is spoken, and the Word is light, and the light is the life of men. Same John, last part of verse 9. He gave us Jesus so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the satisfaction for our sin problem. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. Time out. Stop. Does that look familiar? Right in the middle of nowhere. Just the same guy can't get off of it. He does it in John 1. He does in 1 John 4. He goes, hey, guess what? By the way, no one's ever seen God. Nobody loves what he looks like. 
Why do you do this again, John? Because in John 1, Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and words with God, the Word was God, and the Word spoke, and there was light, came into the darkness, and touched your chaos, and light became life, and man has life, and of his fullness you received grace for grace. By the way, nobody knows what God looks like, but Jesus came to exegete the Father, show you what he looked like. And John says, that to me is fascinating because now i got another Adam in the middle of my chaos to show me how to overcome my chaos. And all i really got to do is pay attention to this guy because I've got his fullness, grace for grace. Don't know what God looks like, but i got a feeling he looks like Jesus. That's John. 1 John 4, same guy. He goes, God is love. And if a man loves God, is loved of God, he knows what God is. By the way, nobody knows what God looks like. Same argument. Watch how he solves it in 1 John 4. 12, no one's seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love has been perfected in us. Time out. Nobody knows what God looks like, but if we love one another. Let's say it again. Nobody knows what God looks like. But if we love one another, then we know what he looks like down here. Because what's the line? Nobody knows what God looks like, but if we love one another, he abides in us. His light has penetrated our chaos. And so if we love, then that must be what God looks like. 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us the Holy Spirit. There's a whole other set of sermons. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him, and he lives in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God. God abides in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. And if someone says, I love God, but hates his brother, that man's a liar because he does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love the God who he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. What did Jesus say in John 15 was his new commandment to his disciples? This is the commandment that I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So if you want to touch chaos, I, went, I, I could have started here, but I end here. Because to me, it's the apex. You've got to show the world what a loving God looks like. We don't know what God looks like, so we've got to see him in our neighbor. This is why when we get together as a group, we get to see Jesus in the Word, but we get to see Jesus in each other. The expressions of love that come out of our brother. We say, well, that's what Jesus looks like. That Jesus that is in you, and you are in him, has given you the antidote to chaos. He has spoken a word into your chaos. Follow him. Don't at your own peril. He doesn't leave you or forsake you. Lo, he is with you even until the end of the world. But we don't have to live the measly lives of darkness that so many of us for so long have lived. It's time to raise our hand. Stop passing the buck and live the Jesus that lives inside. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you tonight? Is he speaking anything through you, in you, to you? You've got a question in your heart. I'm not, not, I don't believe I'm the answer, man. I think we sometimes take for granted that this is a deep, deep, these are deep waters. The grace of God is not shallow. It runs deep. I think we treat it sometimes a little too shallow. Like we've got it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. But it's okay to question. I think it's where we're going to get to the answers. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. But what do you say? How do you speak authority in that? Because if you're going through financial it's depression, good. you know, anything in your life, you know, you, like you said, you don't, yeah. like, I, didn't, I even know for myself, especially before this, this sermon, like, I would say 
Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Good. Jesus only faces three deal, three three temptations in the wilderness, and, and he quotes three verses. He doesn't face ten thousand things in the wilderness so that he can teach us ten thousand verses. So what we have to do is take the template. So the template is that Jesus knows he's a son, and Jesus knows what the Father has said about the Son. So the challenge for you is know who you are. You're one of the daughters of God. What does God say about this daughter? Okay. What does God say about this daughter in this moment? And when you face your chaos, you, you have to make the decisions Jesus made. Okay. Jesus makes the decision, I will not sacrifice long-term gain for temporary satisfaction. I got to make that decision. I can decide not to. I can, I can decide, screw that. I'm going to do what I want. Okay. Good luck. Here comes chaos. Boom. Jesus decides, I'm not going to throw myself off there. It does matter what I do. Dad would catch me, but what good is that for you? These are the decisions he makes, but he has a scripture that soothes his heart. Find that. That's your challenge. That's your ability to search out his word to face your chaos. That is why when I meet Christians that don't read this because they go, I don't trust translations, I go... You are rolling in chaos. I've never met a believer yet that doesn't read this book that's not rolling in chaos. That they don't read this and they don't have problems. So we've all got to keep going back to the well and saying, what does God say for me here? And what I've found is it's not always what he says for you, what he's going to say for me. That's why some people will go, I was reading this verse today and here's what it said to me. Here's what it did in my life. And I'll read it and think, I ain't get anything out of that. Now, that doesn't mean that's not a good verse. That's not my chaos, okay? I'm not facing that chaos. They were obviously facing that chaos, and the Holy Spirit that lives in them went, here's your verse. Now, you can do with it what you want to do with it, but here's your verse. And we, we love that, so we share it with people, and sometimes it means something to them, and sometimes it does. Don't get your feelings hurt if, you use a, if the verse speaks to you and nobody else wants to put it on a T-shirt, you know? Don't, don't worry about that. It's okay. My point is, Jesus only has three opportunities, but it's metaphorically, he's telling you for 10,000 opportunities, there's 10,000 words of God. For 50,000 opportunities, there's going to be 50,000 words of God. Dig into this and find out what the Holy Spirit is saying through you and to you. Does that help? Yeah, it's not, not just an individual verse. We don't, I know a lot of times we want like a book that goes, if you're facing this, then read these eight verses. And that's okay too. In fact, maybe that helps. Maybe you can't find them and you know, well, look, I need a verse about finances. So you go buy a book that says 25 verses on finances. Okay, great. Read them. Probably 23 of them are going to mean squat to you. Because again, they spoke to the guy writing that or this team of people that, you know, used Bible Hub and put a bunch of verses together and published it. But let it be individual. Let the Holy Spirit give that to you. Anybody else? I think I'm faced more Paul with, like, occasionally other people's chaos. Yeah. Coming. Yeah. Well, practical advice, I don't want to make your chaos my chaos. So if I'm faced with you facing chaos, the last thing I want to do is jump in and make my world chaotic. So I do believe there, there has to be a separation between me ministering to you and me uh, becoming, getting into your, your chaos. So... And that's case to case. It's, it's really just hearing the spirit on how to deal. There are going to be people that you cannot help without destroying yourself. Okay, you are going to want to help everybody because we all have a little Messiah complex, particularly for people we love. So I want to straighten their life out. I want to fix them. I want to help them. But all that that does in some cases is, is you jumped into a, a, a lake with a drowning person and they are not sufficiently beating themselves to death yet. So now they're going to drown two people. So they're going to do everything they can to use you as a buoy <laughs> and pull you under until they can breathe again. And you be damned in their mind, whatever. If you die, you die. Um, nobody thinks of it that way, but that's kind of how we treat sometimes when people jump in our chaos. Well, you're in this with me. And that, that's trouble. So you have to follow the spirit to know at what point you intersect them at what point you help them at what point you 
even the good Samaritan only could do so much to the man beaten by the wayside. Okay. Some of it was even from a distance. Put him in the inn, pay for a week, step away. We have no idea what happens in week two. Okay. With the guy. That, that might not even be a great illustration. That was just kind of like top the, of the head. Let not your heart be troubled. Yeah. I can't let not for you. You can't let not for me. That's a good verse. That is good. Yeah. Choice. Yeah. 